Hello, my friends and enemies, and welcome to the 23rd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I am your host, Steve Patterson, and for about the past 10 years or so, I have been on the pursuit of truth and have discovered lots of interesting philosophies along the way. One of them I've identified and dubbed as irrationalism. It's the idea that reality is fundamentally unknowable, there is no such thing as truth, logic is contradictory, the universe is paradoxical, and a significant part of my work is exploring why people believe that this could be so. Why is it that some people passionately believe the idea that the truth is that there's no truth? So that investigation has taken me from quantum physics to the liar's paradox to religious claims to examinations about logic and mathematics. But you can also find it manifested in higher academia, the school of thought called postmodernism. So that's what I've brought my guest onto the show today to talk about. He's Dr. Stephen Hicks, who's written a book called Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault. Now, some of you, if you're like me, might already have experience with postmodernism in the humanities departments at your current college. I'm talking about the English professors, to some extent maybe the history professors, and maybe from the sociology department. You might find yourself as one of the lone rationalist individuals saying such naive things like, objective truth exists. And of course, by simply mentioning such an absurd idea, you're ostracized and treated as being naive. Now, if that sounds like you, I do have some good news. The current sponsor of the show is a company called Praxis, and they specialize in taking passionate, competent young people out of higher ed and into the real world. They land their participants paid apprenticeships. They give them real-world job skill training. And after you've completed their program, they guarantee you a $40,000 a year job offer. Plus, you don't have to worry about being condemned for believing in such things like objective truth. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, either because you're currently stuck in academia or because you want to avoid it altogether, then check out their website at discoverpraxis.com. And on their homepage, there's a button that says schedule a call. Click it, set up an appointment, talk to them, and see if it sounds right for you. So back to philosophy and my discussion with Dr. Stephen Hicks, who is the professor of philosophy at Rockford University in Illinois. In this interview, we don't just talk about postmodernism. We also cover what he calls pre-modernism and modernism. So for about the first half hour of this interview, we're covering about 1,500 years of philosophy. Now, if that doesn't interest you, if you don't really care about the history of philosophy, skip ahead to about the half-hour mark where we start diving more into postmodern philosophy, which is very closely tied to the philosophy that I have called irrationalism. Enjoy. Thank you, Stephen, for sitting down and talking with me about the subject. I hope it'll be fun. Uh, a lot of your work has focused on postmodernism, explaining the philosophy. What I'd really like to do is focus first on basic concepts. I think when we're trying to understand any philosophy, any claim about reality, you got to first focus on the basics before you get into more advanced stuff. And before diving into postmodernism, it would make sense just to first start with modernism or even pre-modernism. This is an approach that you take in your book. And I was hoping that you could just spend maybe a few minutes explaining some of the basic concepts in, we'll start with pre-modernism, and maybe I'll ask you some questions about that. And then we'll talk about modernism for a few minutes, and then the rest of the discussion we can focus on postmodernism. All right. Good structure. So I think that most ideas don't come in little isolated packets. It's not just, it, I think it's a mistake to just to focus on epistemological claims or metaphysical claims. Usually those claims come whole package in regards to a bigger worldview. So if we could speak in broad brushstrokes, obviously we're going to be missing some nuance. In your mind, what is the pre-modern worldview, if you could summarize it? Right. Well, each of the you know, issues in philosophy, you can uh, separate it out and consider particular arguments for and against on their own merits. But yeah, the, the goal of philosophy is to integrate those into uh, an entire philosophy that guides you in your life as a whole. And then, uh, of course, what we're interested in is how those ideas uh, uh, play off against each other over the course of history and how they uh, then influence historical eras. So if we take right, very broad stroke uh, breakdowns of uh, historical eras, uh, clearly something happened in the early modern world, and so we say the modern world represents a break with the, uh, the pre-modern. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I would then say, if we're just going to talk about the pre-modern, of course, then we can talk about lots of ancient civilizations and so on. But the target in question uh, in the modern era, in the early modern era, is to contrast what was going on then as a break with, say, what had been going on in the previous 1,000 years. Mm-hmm. So if we take essentially from, say, the decline of Rome uh, on through uh, the Renaissance, that's about a 1,000-year chunk of time, and we ask what was the dominant intellectual framework in the West, and we call it that pre-modernism, then mm-hmm. we say it's some form of broadly religious philosophy, and then more specifically, it's a form of uh, Christian philosophy. Uh, and then uh, from our modern perspective, Christianity breaks down to a number of things. We would say essentially it's a form of Catholic Christian philosophy uh, that's dominating mm-hmm. that era. Now then, uh, to narrow that down right more specifically, then we say, well, who are the, the major intellectuals right, who frame the, uh, the, the thinking for that era? Then certainly we have to say uh, Augustine, uh, St. Augustine uh, as the dominant thinker. And then uh, by the time we get into uh, uh, 600 years, 700 years later, then we're into Aquinas, who in some ways is a break with, uh, with Augustine, uh, but uh, a continuity as well. Mm-hmm. So then we would say, all right, so essentially what we have is a Catholic Christian philosophy that is the intellectual framework for the era. Then we say, well, what do we mean by a, a philosophy? Uh, philosophy has a number of sub-questions. You know, I think I did once did a tally. Uh, there's a little, uh, I think I came up with something like 113 kind of core issues that are philosophical issues. That's too many <laughs> to, uh, to go through. So we, we chunk those issues into broadly metaphysical, uh, epistemological, uh, questions about human nature, questions about ethics, and then uh, questions about political right, philosophy as well. So what we get then, uh, if we uh, uh, go this route then, is we have a metaphysics that is oriented toward the supernatural. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have an epistemology that emphasizes uh, first mysticism, right, in the form of revelations right, received by prophets uh, back in time. Uh, delivered to a select few individuals, but then the rest of us are to accept those on faith uh, as absolutely binding. We have a view of human nature that emphasizes kind of a duality, right, of human nature. It's uh, matter and spirit, right? It's body versus soul. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a sense uh, of the, the, the badness of human nature, a strong notion of original sin, Right, that people either can't control themselves, uh, uh, and that's either because they don't know any better, or even if they do know better, their uh, their badness right outs. Uh, and then the idea also that human beings uh, are by nature subject; they should be subject to higher authority, most uh, specifically God. Uh, you have an ethic, right? Then, if we turn to ethics issues, that emphasizes kind of an anti-materialism, uh, and even uh, kind of valorizes a uh, an ascetic right approach to life. Mm-hmm. So, the best human beings are people like monks and nuns who who vow poverty and obedience and celibacy and dedicate themselves to to living according to those values. Uh, and then we uh, we have a uh, when we turn to political issues, essentially mm-hmm. a, a hierarchical and authoritarian right political structure where everyone, of course, is uh, uh, to be subject to God, right, who is at the top, and then to uh, to obey. And then God's representatives on earth, right, uh, uh, the uh, the temporal political structures manifested in the uh, in the church. Pope, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, all the way down to the broad mass of people at the bottom mm-hmm. who are the laity. And then that theological, right, institutional structure uh, it is a very natural fit with uh, feudal structures where you have the king at the top with all authority. And uh, you integrate that with a kind of a divine right of kings idea. Uh, and you have the same structure all the way down. Mm-hmm. So something like that then uh, is broadly what I am calling pre-modernism, and that's what okay. 
early moderns are reacting against. So when you say early modern, where do you where do you roughly put the transitionary period from those ideas maybe to the next phase of modernism? Yeah, 1400s, 1500s, and then certainly mm -hmm. on into the 1600s. So who are some of the thinkers, the initial thinkers that started to question and change that prevailing paradigm? Yeah. Well, there's a school right of, uh, of thinkers in northern Italy. Uh, school might be a, a bit strong, but there's certainly a collection of thinkers who broadly are known as uh, humanists. And uh, so what you find in them is an increasing interest in the natural world. A lot of it is uh, through a great admiration of uh, the, the newly uh, admired texts of the Greeks and the Romans, right, with their much more worldly concerns. I like to uh, to uh, emphasize Galileo, right, is extremely mm -hmm. important here. Uh, that big epistemological battle uh, that he is a front man for uh, with respect to the authority of the senses and experiment and reasoning, right, versus the traditional authorities. So that epistemological battle, right, is being engaged there. Uh, with respect to human nature, right, we have a, 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 in the Renaissance, uh, the cultivation of the individual, uh, a, a, a re uh, a kind of a discovery and emphasis of the idea that people are not necessarily sinners, right, but that human beings can be beautiful, right, and noble. Uh, uh, we have a, an ethic that encourages uh, people to cultivate their talents in a way that. Uh, that enables them to enjoy their lives, to enjoy uh, worldly values, and that's not in opposition to cultivating your spiritual values or your or your uh, your psychological values. Uh, and then also at that same time, right in politics, you start to see a breakdown of the hierarchical structures uh, in Florence and Venice, the reintroduction of uh, republican forms of government. Uh, new forms of uh, early democracies in some of the city states, right, and so on. So even if you go back to the 1400s uh, in northern Italy, you uh, you see an increasing naturalism, an increasing reliance on uh, empiricism, the senses and reason, cultivation of the individual, kind of worldly ethical values. And uh, kind of a, an initial flattening, uh, that's a little bit too strong, but a little weakening uh, of the, uh, the traditional political hierarchies as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so would it be fair to say, if we were to, to speak very um, imprecisely, that roughly the modernist worldview is going from the supernatural to the natural, and from what you might call the irrational or the non-rational or the mystical to the rational, yep. and what you might view as from the hierarchical, the strongly hierarchical, to the individual. Is that fair? Sure, yes. Okay. Uh, so that would boil it down to three points, yes, and that's uh, mm -hmm. essentially fine. And already that's going on in the, uh, in the 1400s in northern Italy. In the 1500s, of course, we have to talk about the, uh, the, uh, the Reformation, uh, and what that means for religious thinking, but the religious thinking, mm -hmm. has, you know, has a huge amount of epistemological uh, battle. Do we, uh, as the Protestants emphasize, say that each individual has to have his or her own relationship, right, with God, right? Uh, so then you're saying that each individual's judgment, right, should be respected. Uh, um, and then that cultivates then people's uh, ability to debate because then people start intensely debating all of the religious texts. Mm. And even though the Protestants were reformers were not uh, you know advocates of reason, uh, as an unintended consequence, to the extent that people are arguing all over the place about <laughs> what religious text means, then uh, it, de facto you get a cultivation of people's intellectual abilities. Uh, you have a you know, cultivation of more individualism because then uh, as a result of the, the Reformation, counter-Reformation battles, you have a lot of breakaway individuals going off and starting their own churches. You have uh, the emphasis that if uh, individuals are going to have their own relationship with God, then that means that they need to go know God's word for themselves. Mm -hmm. So you have a mass movement toward teaching uh, young people to read. 
And then again, as an unintended consequence, when people start read one book, they're interested in reading other books. So people start mm. to become more educated. And so uh, epistemologically, right, then uh, in the early modern world, we have a, a, uh, uh, you know, a strong increase in uh, uh, epistemological individualism, right, to use that mm -hmm. phrase. Also in the uh, 1500s, right, important is, uh, you know, Columbus is crossing the ocean, right, bringing the worlds together. The, uh, the era of modern globalization is going on. Uh, and that has you know, huge impact for all kinds of uh, social dimensions. Uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, that is another uh, social political factor that has uh, philosophical significance. So as we move from the early moderns to the later moderns, is this, this sounds like this is what lays the groundwork for what most people think of as the Enlightenment. Is this essentially... Yes. Was the Enlightenment then the maybe the peak or the manifestation of of the modern ideas? I think so. Yes, right. So what you have is a lot of uh, uh, in the early modern era, uh, European thinkers kind of rediscovering the Greeks and the Romans, and in fact, they're going back to school. Uh, there's <laughs> there are some uh, you know independent new discovery that's going on, but a lot of it really is rediscovery and it's not necessarily systematic yet uh and then a lot of things that are happening in lots of areas and then as people in the 1500s and early 1600s start to reflect on the significance of the new world that's being created right then they're developing a, an explicit philosophy um, uh, uh, to, to, to formulate their understanding of the new kind of world that's going on. And then that all matures by the you know, late 1600s, certainly the early uh, 1700s. And then yeah, we are into what we call the age of enlightenment, where to some extent, a lot of these philosophical revolutions have right, already occurred. And what's going on is that it's being uh, conceptualized the arguments mm. for them are more sophisticatedly developed. Uh, the developments in epistemology and in politics and ethics are being integrated with each other, and so you have a kind of coherent, systematic worldview that you can call, say, uh, the Enlightenment philosophy. What I find interesting um, is around this time period, the political correlate of the of this philosophy is something like a great liberalization um, or a great classical liberalization, as we might have to call it today, where you had the opening of markets, you had um, the degradation of the institution of slavery, you had, um, <clears throat> to some extent, um, uh, protectionism, uh, nativism is somewhat um, replaced by this idea of international trade. Mm -hmm. And what I think is a, a an error is to think that this is out of the blue. There's just an historical artifact. And I think what the, the underlying causes does point to some something like a change in the philosophy. You know, absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the uh, arguments for liberalization across a number of dimensions, you know, if you're going to be liberal in your religion, right, for example, Right, uh, then that is underlying the concept that individuals, right, should be able to make up their own minds, and we're going to trust people, right, to to make mm -hmm. their decisions, and that it's properly private, right, uh, uh, and so that's an individualism. If you think uh, that uh, <clears throat> you mentioned slavery, for example, uh, that slavery becomes a, a moral abomination, right, by the time we get to the end of the 17th, and really for the first time in human history. Uh, that notion is there. Well, again, that slaves are individuals, right, as well, uh, that they are, they are human beings, and so they have the same capacities, right, that uh, any mm -hmm. human being, right, should have. And that's, again, an individualistic theme. Uh, right, if you are going to uh, liberalize markets, in many cases, the arguments are that you know, any individual with normal capacities, right, can... Uh, uh, govern his or her own business life, right, and economic life, make their own decisions about what their careers are going to be, whom they're going to trade with, and so on. And again, that's uh, an emphasis on the capacity of individuals to govern their own lives. Uh, 
or if you're interested in uh, democratic and republican modes of political organization again those devolve political power to the individual mm-hmm. You think about the, you know, the, the astonishing confidence right? <laughs> in individual judgment. Uh, if you are going to have any sort of democratic political system, well, you're going to say individuals should be able to, the broad mass of them, think about important political matters, have arguments about them, and then cast mm-hmm. formed and responsible votes. So, yeah, so I'm agreeing with, right, with your point right, that you know, in all of these different areas, it could look like they're springing up out of the blue, but there are underlying individualistic and pro-reason principles that have become mm-hmm. spread. And so the, that more basic set of philosophical principles is being leveraged in a whole bunch of particular areas socially. So what then do you see as the general time frame to the transition from the modern era to now the postmodern era? What Not just what are the... What's the time frame? But who are do you think the the foundational thinkers that started this this transition? Yeah. Well, let me unless this, uh, the first part of your claim. I think we still are living in a in the modern era. Uh, mm-hmm. Essentially, our culture, right, modern twenty first century global culture, is modernist culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when we say that we are living in postmodern times, I would make that a more modest claim, because in my view, we do have a very vigorous postmodern movement in intellectual circles, but even that's too broad in some intellectual Mm. circles, in the humanities, Mm. some areas, in the social sciences, and so forth. Uh, And they've had some cultural manifestations in in the arts and other areas as well, certainly in in the educational establishment. Um, So what I would then say is that we have a broadly modernist culture that in some Mm. respects, uh, important respects, is still vigorous and thriving, but that there are within some subcultures or sub-institutions within that broader modernist culture, a a very vigorous uh, postmodern intellectual framework. Mm. Uh, Then the second part of your question is, so when this starts to happen, uh, I put the Uh, the dates to be in the second half of the 17th century, so, or sorry, the 1700s. So the 1700s or the long uh, 18th century is broadly, right, we call it the Age of Enlightenment, you know, uh, call it the long uh, uh, 18th century, because you have to go back to Locke and Newton uh, at the end of the 1600s, and then on, say, through uh, Napoleon. But then what you have is in that within that um, uh, Enlightenment era, uh, all of the philosophical issues are always vigorously being debated and all of the major pre- positions are represented. But what starts to happen toward the end of the 1700s is that there's a vigorous uh, reaction right against many of the Enlightenment themes. Uh, uh, we start to see this particularly in Northeastern Europe, and in my view, it's in the uh, the German states, and uh, I focus on on Kant and some of the other Germans. Uh, so what you find right in them is a reaction right against uh, right many of the cl- very strong claims that the Enlightenment thinkers were making about the power of reason to Mm -hmm. answer all of life's questions and uh, dramatically to reshape all of society's institutions in a progressive direction. Uh, And so any philosophy or philosopher then that is uh, critical uh, about the powers of reason and sets himself to put severe limits on the capacity of reason that person then would mark a turning away from the Enlightenment. Mm. So, uh, uh, again, this is uh, uh, very broad strokes, but uh, if we focus on Kant's philosophy with his critique, right, of pure reason, right, where he sets out as as part of his project, right, to say that uh, reason cannot, in fact, uh, come to know the most important truths about the nature of the world and human identity, uh, and then develop some very sophisticated philosophical arguments right in support of that conclusion that is uh, is anti-enlightenment. 
And that's uh, perhaps the most provocative right, thesis uh, in my, mm -hmm. uh, my postmodern work. And partly, uh, uh, this is uh, to speak not specifically of uh, you know, philosophical epistemological issues, but Kant does, uh, does argue that uh, human beings do need certain regulative beliefs in their life. They need to believe in a kind of God. They need to believe in immortality of the soul and freedom of the will. And he believes that Enlightenment philosophy is going to destroy all of those beliefs. Mm. So if uh, you can find a way uh, to, uh, to, to limit the claims of reason and science, then that's going to, as he puts it, uh, make room for uh, the kinds of beliefs that he thinks are philosophically important. Mm -hmm. And in this, he's uh, joined in a, a large number of early, what I call counter-enlightenment right, philosophers. To some extent, this was driven by uh, political concerns. We mentioned Napoleon right a little earlier, you know, out of the the, uh, the degradation that followed from the uh, the French Revolution. Right, Napoleon rises to power, and then he uh, you know sweeps through Eastern Europe, conquering everywhere. Uh, you know, he beats the German states, you know, and they're they're really horrified by this. They uh, they see, from their perspective, right, Napoleon really as a, a Westerner. They see him as a representative of, uh, of Enlightenment philosophy uh, and the French Enlightenment, uh, and so they are, very, you know, very concerned to say, uh, how are we going to, so to speak, reinvigorate uh, Germanness uh, mm. uh, against right uh, these uh, these French imports right that are being. They're not actually imported. They're being imposed upon us, right, by this foreign conqueror. So partly motivated by oh. you know, just you know political nationalistic reasons, you get a reaction against everything from the West, uh, and, and that then includes all of the Enlightenment ideas of you know, separation of church and state comes under attack. Uh, uh, the ideas of uh, of individualism. The secularism and so on, all of which are part of the Enlightenment package. I'm very glad that you make that distinction um, between the um, what you might call higher academia culture, which I think is, in my own experience, is thoroughly postmodern in um, several areas. Maybe not so much in the hard sciences, but certainly in the humanities, for example. I think you see um, anti-Enlightenment ideas very popular. But you're, I think you're, you are very correct to point out that in the society at large, um, I think you see, well, you certainly have the postmodern um, uh, ideas, but I think the majority of people have not bought on to um, the postmodern value system or anti-value system. Uh, and in fact, what's really interesting is right now, I think just in the last year, since you see this um, remarkable political Trump phenomenon, I think it has to do with um, people's rejection and mockery and disdain for some of the, uh, what people might call absurdities mm. um, coming out of the uh, humanities departments. Now, in my own analysis, I think uh, they go to the absurd in the other direction, but I think <laughs> that's partly a broader cultural shift um, that, that, that rejects the... Um, postmodern ideas. I, I'm hoping maybe you can talk, this would be a good uh, segue to talk more and maybe in more detail about what is packaged in the postmodern worldview um, in regards to metaphysics, in regards to um, epistemology. So if, for example, our reason is flawed, do we have any method of accessing the truth? If there is no such thing, for example, as truth, then what are we doing by trying to communicate, uh, communicate about philosophy? and so on, and maybe some of the political theories, too. Yeah, good question. Um, so if we uh, then fast forward, so to speak, to uh, mid-20th century when the leading postmodern intellectuals right, are uh, coming to prominence, so 1950s, 1960s, uh, and here, I say the you know, the big names are people like Michel Foucault, uh, you know, Jacques Derrida, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, and the, uh, those are all French, because uh, the, the French were really were taking the lead here. On the American side, uh, Richard Rorty uh, is a huge name, maybe Stanley Fish, uh, a little more in literary criticism, but a very philosophical right, literary critic. Uh, 
if we take them as representative of the postmodern vanguard, right, all of them are, uh, uh, with the exception of Fish, uh, uh, philosophy right, PhDs, and all of them uh, in their you know, graduate training and much of their early writing are engaged with epistemological issues. And what we do find in them is a, a strong skepticism right, about the, uh, the power of reason. And so what has happened, uh, again, this is very broad strokes, is from the high aspirations that the Enlightenment had for the power of reason uh, on you know, dozens of technical issues in philosophy, uh, how does reason work out with respect to integrating with, uh, with, with perception and observational data? How do we form abstract concepts? How do we integrate those into propositions? How do we take propositions and integrate them into, uh, into uh, to theories? What's the nature of uh, grammar? How do we uh, 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 you know, develop the logical and mathematical tools and so on? So dozens and dozens of sub-issues that are necessary to develop a full and robust theory of reason. By the time we get to the mid 20th century uh, in both the analytic and continental traditions, broadly speaking, uh, it's a very skeptical moment right, in philosophy. And so what we get uh, uh, are our thinkers, right, the early postmodern thinkers, right, who believe that reason uh, is not uh, able at all to come to, to know right, the truth. So what we get, for example, is you know someone like Foucault, right, in a very deep way, saying you know, that uh, there is no such thing as truth, uh, and so truth then starts to be a word that's used ironically, right, or it's always put in quotation marks, uh, or it's relativized that there are only truths depending on a given person's uh, cognitive framework, uh, which has no more standing than anybody else's right cognitive framework. Hmm. Or you know, the notions that you know truth uh, and reality uh, and reason, uh, these are all things that really are meaningless. Um, uh, so it's just uh, it's pointless to try to exert any more philosophical energy in figuring out what the truth is, right? And uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, Derrida, Foucault, and Rorty, they will all, uh, in their historically informed way, say, you know, the Enlightenment project was based on reason, and we are now at the end of the Enlightenment project. It has utterly failed. Uh, and so now our, our philosophical question is, what are we supposed to do right now that we no longer, so to speak, believe in truth, reason, uh, reality, uh, and so on? Mm -hmm. so how are those ideas translated into um, shifts in political theory? Yeah, well, one way to do it is uh, then to say, all right, well, if we're not really then interested in figuring out what the truth is, uh, if that's no longer going to be our core value, right, as philosophers to seek, uh, what are we then supposed to do? The uh, standard substitute concept is the concept of power. So uh, we do have values, and these values are subjectivized, right, and relativized. Uh, but it's not that anyone's values are truer or even necessarily better, right, than anyone else's. So all we can do is say that people are trying to assert their values uh, and then necessarily since the values are relativized, all of our values are coming into conflict with each other. And the way we're going to resolve conflict is not through reasoned debate and discussion because we don't believe in reason anymore. Uh, it's not a matter of figuring out whose values are truer, right, or good because we don't believe in objective truth and goodness anymore. So the way we resolve conflicts then is uh, only through power. So power then comes to be seen, uh, this might be a bit strong, but power really is the, the metaphysical substrate, so to speak. The world's hmm. understood only in terms of power struggles. So uh, uh, here, of course, uh, you know, Nietzsche right, becomes to be uh, perhaps one of the most important forerunners Right of the uh, of the postmodern thinkers, you know, Nietzsche. Uh, of course, he was still doing metaphysics, and he had a robust metaphysical theory. 
but it was all a, uh, a power-based metaphysical theory. Everything is reduced to power, uh, including our philosophies. They're all relativized to our power struggles. Uh, and so th that's why, you know, when someone like Foucault, uh, who actually just called himself a Nietzschean, <laughs> a Nietzschean absent the metaphysics, uh, uh, you put power struggles to the fore. And then once you put power right to the to the fore, but it's not power in the service of truth, or it's not power in the service of goodness or justice, um, then you have really an amoral uh, understanding of social dynamics. So, as a so two things. First, as a funny aside, when you're, I'm very glad that um, you give that analysis because it reminds me of my time in undergrad, where I spent a semester at uh, Washington, uh, or American University in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and I was doing kind of an internship program there. And there was uh, one of the obligatory classes I had to take was a class on Russian history. And I know I never forget this because the professor was uh, from Boston, and so she had this very, very heavy accent. And she, the class was one of the most... Um, superficial or fake or if I might be so bold bullshitty classes I've ever been in in my life because mm -hmm. she was obsessed with Foucault and she would all in her class on Russian history she would you know um, prescribe readings that came from Foucault and pretty much every class on several occasions she would mention the power structures mm. uh, of in, in applying her analysis of how the world works and it was so funny to me because I, I literally had a, a running joke um, kind of a, a, a macabre one where I was essentially trying to see how much nonsense, fluff, and irrational writing I could get away with in that class as I would submit uh, articles uh, right. weekly and see if I could still get an A. And it was to the point where I was intentionally making like absurd, ab absolute, you know, abject open absurdities, but then I would incorporate Foucault into it. Um, and she she ate it up, and I got an A in that class. Yeah, that's a funny aside because that's exactly the the worldview right. that she uh, she was emanating. But right. um, what so, is? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There, obviously, there are going to be degraded versions of postmodernism. Uh, you know, once right. you start, you, know, you set aside the issue of truth and the the uh, and logic and structure and the idea of objective standards, then how do you tell the difference between what, what's good and what isn't? Right. Uh, yeah, and so yeah, one of the, the issues that we're always struggling with is how do you tell the difference between bullshit and anything that's not bullshit right, uh, right. once you've stepped into that, into that world. But let me do say, though, uh, you know, Foucault is sure. a deep, deep guy, and I think he's a very important thinker. And in uh, you know, some of his things, I do find myself right, in, in sympathy, particularly when he's critical of certain other uh, pretentious philosophical uh, outlets. So I wouldn't uh, want to say uh, in any sh way, shape, or form that Foucault is a bullshitter. I think there mm. are you know, bullshitty things that he uh, is doing. A lot of times he's uh, a little more fooling around. And the same thing with respect to uh, to Rorty. I think Rorty was always a very serious guy, uh, well-versed in, uh, in in all the major philosophical traditions. Um, uh, so you might then say you know, these are serious right, thinkers grappling with serious issues and reaching conclusions that leave us unable to distinguish between uh, bullshit and non-bullshit, but they're mm -hmm. not doing bullshit. Yes, this is an excellent transition into what I want to ask you, um, because when talking about this, just the actual epistemology of this worldview, what is uh, screaming in my mind yeah. is, what uh, is it not a claim about reality to claim that we cannot know reality isn't that a claim isn't that a, making a truth claim itself yeah right so you, then you get into all the uh, self-referential contradictions um, you know if you try to state skepticism right so if you want to say you know the truth is that there's no truth right or mm -hmm. I know that we know nothing right or uh, you know the absolute truth is that everything is relative right, <laughs> right. or uh, 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 you know there is no there is no, uh, uh, there are no meta narratives, right? But that's a meta narrative claim, right? Itself. Mm -hmm. So, and this is certainly something that the uh, the uh, the postmoderns struggle with, because at the same time, you know, they are saying that uh, you know language is fundamentally, in a way, non-communicative, 
in the right. way that we have traditionally thought of language, right, as uh, as communicative. And then it seems like uh, you know at that point you should take the uh, the uh, the Cratylus option, as I think about it, Cratylus being an ancient Greek right skeptic, right, who realized you know that uh, uh, you know if words mean nothing, right, ultimately then the only proper response is to say nothing, right. So he just mm -hmm. like, shut up right, for the rest <laughs> of the time. So the question then is, what are you trying to do when you are using words and you know, apparently right, trying to communicate people and, and uh, marshal what you might call evidence and arguments right, to try to convince people rationally that they should adopt your, your uh, non-rational or, or anti-reason right, worldview? Right. Uh, so here, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll take uh, Rorty, right? You know, at one point he says uh, that he made a decision that he's no longer going to think of himself as a philosopher, as someone who's trying to work with the scientists or work with the, the physicists. And he came out of, uh, at least in his formal training in his early career, kind of a, a logical positivistic and then a broadly positivistic or uh, analytic right approach to philosophy and one of the hallmarks right of that uh, entire philosophical tradition is to say that the philosophers should see the scientists as the uh, the major exponents of what truth seeking is all about mm -hmm. and uh, you know as the name analysis suggests that what philosophers do is they are providing analytic guidance right to the scientists who are working on all of these problems so the job of the philosophers is to analyze the various components that go into scientific method you know, various uh, data organizational right methods and proposition formation and the logical and mathematical tools that the scientists will use so we are so to speak handmaidens right of the scientists and the scientists are broadly speaking looking for for the truth Mm -hmm. uh, but then what Rorty realizes, right, as he goes on his uh, philosophical journal or journey, rather, is that uh, you reach skeptical dead ends, as the uh, as the analytic tradition did by the 1950s. Uh, um, uh, you know, here, Kuhn in the early 60s and Paul Feyerabend, also in the 1960s, kind of sounding the death knell. That it's really it's just a bunch of uh, paradigms and that we make these leap of faith shifts from one paradigm to another and we have to talk about science not in terms of truth and progress but rather in terms of more uh, socially subjective paradigms that hold for a group of scientists for a given period of time and mm -hmm. and we leap into some other one so Rorty is all uh, you know sophisticatedly involved in those discussions at that point and basically what he says is you know I, I realize that uh, you know I right as a philosopher am no longer an ally of the scientists instead I need to see myself as an ally of the poets hmm. so what we ask then is if that's uh, the important shift right well what are poets doing right and in a way, you know, we can talk about poets uh, questing for truth and so on. But our, our uh, more common understanding is that poets just make stuff up. <laughs> they are totally, okay, so... they, they're totally in a fictional universe. And the idea is that we are creating right, linguistic structures that are expressive but they're not expressive of any sort of objective reality. Instead, they are expressive of subjective states. I, I hear that, but there's still that voice in my head that says, well, hang on. If he's saying I am no longer an ally of the of philosophers, I am now doing the work of poetry, is that not still inescapably a claim about what is in reality? And even if he were to say something like, um, I am in my own reality, we right. are all in our own reality. Does is that that still does not satisfactorily ex, uh, get over the, the that question? Are you not still making a claim about reality? Yeah, there is no way right to escape the paradoxes, right? and so okay. uh, no, 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 I agree with you right on that point. So if Rorty right at this point is saying, well, this is what poets really do, right? Poets <laughs> right. really are 
in, in a, they really are subjects and they have internal psychological states and in their, uh, their language, they are expressing these things and that's different mm -hmm. from various other, well, yeah, all of those are to make realistic objective claims about right, a certain kind of human activity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so this is then where the, the irony right then comes in. So what Rorty has to say is, yeah, and I'm not here, right. Making a truth claim instead, all I'm doing is and I have to water it down, right. Is that I'm suggesting right, a certain way of thinking about what we are doing, right, with language. And so a better way to think of it might be to think in terms of what poets do. Uh, and that then is a subjective, self-expressive uh, thing that, uh, you know, rhetorically, when you turn to the reader or the consumer's perspective, right, might press certain value buttons in you and cause you to have a certain right, subjective experience. And so that's uh, then the model of what's going on if we generalize it to all of language and all of discourse, that everybody is merely expressing the way poets do their own subjective value preferences, wherever those come from, and we can talk mm -hmm. about that later. Uh, and we're all, so to speak, rhetorically trying to influence each other the way good rhetoricians do and yeah. that it doesn't help us in understanding this phenomenon to use the concepts of truth or reality now i would love to dive in specifically to uh, unpack more of the philosophy um, sure. that you've just presented because I find that really fascinating. Maybe I'll have to have you on um, sometime in the future because I don't think we're going to have time this right. episode. But I do want to ask you something that I find really um, interesting and maybe you can help Maybe you can help me with this because when you explain that philosophy um, about the subjectivity of everything and to me it is, you know, it, it, like, as you said, the paradoxes are inescapable and I would add the paradoxes are inescapable elementary and self-evident. And however, my perspective is to say a thinker who is serious about um, analyzing phenomena to arrive at such obviously patently inaccurate beliefs, self-contradictory beliefs, I, it's very hard for me to accept the idea that that is in reality a very subtle thinker, mm. that Rorty or a Foucault in regards, or Nietzsche in regards to epistemology, uh, that for me is kind of an unforgivable thing. If you, if your epistemology is such that you, that you make such a base level confusion, mm. then it's very hard for me to accept that there's much else <laughs> that that's not going to be reflected in the other areas in which you've applied your rational analysis. Yeah. So can you help me? Well, part of the, that? Uh... Yeah. yeah, part of the response to be there would say, if you reach a self-contradiction, right, then your reaction, right, Steve Patterson, then is to say, wow, this is a this is a huge problem, and I should be right embarrassed by this. Uh, but, but implicit in that is the idea that self-contradiction is a bad thing. Mm, yes. uh, and self-contradiction is a bad thing only if one is supposed to be logical. And so what we then would need to do is, again, look at the history of epistemology here. And again, look at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the continental tradition, the post-Kantian continental tradition. If uh, you start reading people like uh, Hegel in the next generation uh, and ask, what's the status of logical contradiction in Hegel mm -hmm. or the status of logical contradiction in Marx? Uh, and here you have two thinkers, right, both of whom are rejecting uh, any sort of classical logic coming out of the Aristotelian tradition mm -hmm. uh, in favor of what they would call a dialectical, right, logic, which builds into it uh, the whole notion that contradiction and self-contradiction are kind of metaphysically built into the universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you then look at the early and proto and existentialist thinkers like Kierkegaard and then a little later Nietzsche, right, in the, the subsequent generation after Kierkegaard, and again, you find a very strong disdain for logic uh, as essentially pointless, and that carries on 
through thinkers like uh, Heidegger, and all of these guys, right, Hegel, right, Marx, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, are extraordinarily formative in the thinking of, uh, of the postmodern thinkers, Foucault, Derrida, and so on. So when they get to the point of saying, oh, we've reached a self-contradiction here, that's not a problem, right, because they've already bracketed logic uh, in a fundamental way. And I don't disagree with that in terms of historical analysis, but from what I would say is it might be true that these thinkers are historically um, influential, um, that they wrote a lot of words, but for me, it's it's as close, it, it is, I, I suppose, the ultimate um, litmus test, that if you make, if it's the case that your understanding of self-contradiction is something which does not uh, worry you, then I, I can't escape the idea that that's a reflection on your own um, intellectual um, shallowness, mm. which I, it well, sounds I preposterous. To, yeah, yeah, I have to push back on you. It, I think what, yeah. what I would say is then, so what you have is logic working against itself. Because then when you read all of these guys, they are very logical. So if you just take Richard Rorty as an example here, you know, he starts off as a, as a gung ho right, advocate of uh, analytical philosophy's methods. And he is uh, able to follow the development of very sophisticated arguments over the course of many generations. And that requires uh, a high aptitude for logic and an embracing of logic. But what then happens to you if, as a result of pursuing this intensely right, logical investigation, you reach skeptical anti-logic conclusions? What you've then got is a person, obviously, who's got some psychological torment right, going on inside. <laughs> Uh, and then maybe yeah, the next time we talk, uh, we can talk about <laughs> some of the, the psychology here uh, or how to evaluate people's reactions to that, uh, that self-contradiction when they reach it. Y yes, I would love to. I think that is uh, just a fascinating topic. Um, I really appreciate you. This has been an excellent introduction, uh, an excellent overview. Um, so thanks so much for talking to me about it. Yeah, my pleasure, Steve. Bye for now. All right, so that was my interview with Dr. Stephen Hicks of Rockford University. I hope you guys enjoyed it. There's obviously a great deal more to say on this topic, and I'll make sure to get Dr. Hicks on the show again so we can continue talking more about the psychology of logical contradictions. That's obviously something that, if you've been following my work, you know I'm very much interested in. I freely admit that I am biased towards logical coherence, and I just can't get over the idea that if you're okay with self-contradiction, you're probably not a genuine intellectual. But hopefully he can help me overcome that bias in the future. So that's all for me today. I'll see you guys next week.